How is everybody doing tonight? A couple things. First off, thanks for coming. Second thing um, is that in the fall, we have like a fall and spring semester, not that any group can't meet more than that, uh, you know, like small group, home fellowship group type things. And some of you would be real good uh, at doing that kind of thing. And, and uh, Dan and Sue Thompson there, Dan, Sue, would you stand up? Everybody want you to crank your ear, your heads right at them. Stand up, Dan, Sue. Everybody turn around and look at them right there. And I want you to know if you'd like to open your home, you don't even have to be a great theologian. Uh, you, you, we have uh, right now media. We have people that are great teachers that you can put the right now media. It comes with a, a discussion guide. It's just opening your home because people are starving to connect relationally in our world. This little device that we use in our phone and you know, like clicking here, we text people, we Facebook people, we, we uh, email people, we communicate without face-to-face, -face, without building a true relationship, without seeing a person's face and their heart and hearing the emotion in their voice. There's a lot of misunderstandings that happen on electronic communications that's not personal, and the world is starving for personal relationships, and I would urge you to, to, to either, you know, sign up to in the near future here we'll be having signups if not already i can't remember but to sign up if you'd like to be a part of a group you'd be interested in um in in, in leading the group and also if you can't remember dan and sue pastor carrie or you can call me or pastor jeff the pastor carrie is our discipleship pastor and he he works with them to, to see that ministry and then another another need that we have for su sunday sunday nights um there you know there are some families that come that have small ones and we do have a struggle at, at, at you know, staffing the baby nursery and the, the twos and threes, the little ones. And if you would serve that way like once a month uh, on a Sunday night, that would be really, really great. Uh, and if you could just see me or today, we actually have the Say Yes campaign for the early childhood department. Go back and see Pastor Anna. Uh, is it work? Yeah. Is it worth it? Yeah. Is it probably the highest thing you could do? Yeah. You could cook a meal and take it to a family, but nothing would be higher than watching children during a service for parents that can enjoy that. Because if you can remember when your children were little, how difficult it was and how what a refreshing it would be to have that opportunity. And so uh, anyone that would, would help in that way, uh, do so. I myself, I'm going to sign up. So when I don't preach on Sunday night, occasionally I'm going to be in there. So when you see me, because I do anything and everything that needs to be done and without complaining, and I have no problem with it, and I don't think I'm above it, and if you don't like that, then you come to me and you get enough people to sign up so that I don't have to. But I, some, people, <laughs> some people think I'm the senior pastor and I shouldn't do that. I, I'd do it anyway. I love it. And my, my little grandkids are in there typically, but Paisley, they're not here because Paisley's got this cold, and my, my daughter-in-law is a clean freak germ thing and you know she's not going to spread germs she's not afraid of them herself but she doesn't want her kids spreading any germs to anybody which i appreciate that she's a good one she's a good apple i'll keep her uh and if if austin ever decides he doesn't want her then he's out of the family she stays in that's the way it'll be <laughs> so anyway i hope that some of you are joining online t today tonight i believe this is a message that could be shared you could you could put on your facebook or or somewhere or share the, if you know how to do it, the, uh, the, the uh, link to the message that's being videoed. And it's simply entitled The, the Key to Revelation and a subtitle uh, along with that, I am going to share some of the timeline of end time events. What, how do th things take place and in what order? Jesus, I pray you'd help me to speak tonight. Um, I'm, not, I'm not as, uh, don't have as much strength as I used to have. Uh, and I need your help strength-wise. I need your anointing. I need your ability to speak clearly that people can understand. And uh, God, I pray that it would benefit every, all those who have come to hear. Uh, it's a humbling thing to think that someone would come back to a church on a Sunday night and, and hear what an old guy would have to say. And I, I pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would take it and help us all. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I told you I was doing three weeks out of Revelation 1, and this one is out of Revelation 1, but I actually get into several passages later because there's one verse in Revelation that actually infers many verses looking ahead. And, uh, but 
um, uh, I, I, then I won't be doing any more Revelation messages for a while, but then later, so, some point, which I haven't determined yet, I'll do another three or four week Sunday night series, and I'm going to do chapters two and three, which are the letters to the churches, and seven churches. And then uh, I'll take a break after I do those, and I'll come back, and I'll do uh, beginning in chapter four and five, which is a picture of heaven. And you'll hear tonight that I believe that what we call the rapture of the church takes place in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. I will love you if you're wrong, but I don't think I'm wrong. So you know that makes me think you're wrong. <laughs> and I will say from the beginning, but I'm not bringing it up again, as long as we realize that we're not free from tribulation, because Jesus said, and we've seen it throughout generations, there's tribulation on this earth. We're not going to have an escape route of not necessarily being persecuted for our faith. We've seen it throughout time. Uh, and if you're pre-trib, uh, and if you don't know what that means, then don't worry about it because I'll, I'll get into that a little later date. A mid-trib or, or post-trib in your theology, I don't care because uh, in the end, Jesus is going to come. We all agree that way. So someone once said, and I've quoted them, uh, I'm pan-trib, it'll all pan out in the end because Jesus is going to come back, we're going to be in heaven, and we don't know when he's going to come back, so you best be ready. Can we all agree on that? Yeah. All right. I'm not of the kingdom now thought. Uh, Pat Robertson is wrong. We do not bring the earth good enough so that God will come and reign and that there's no rapture or catching away, uh, that we just go right from earth living, we never leave the earth, and we have a thousand-year reign with Christ I don't believe that. I think that is absolute ludicrous, crazy. There's no scriptural background. I don't even know. He's a smart man. But in that case, uh, I believe he's wrong. If I'm understanding what he teaches, it's something like that. This kingdom now thing. Not right. Uh, in case, so those of you that I, I, I just want to uh, uh, be an equal offender tonight to offend you on your wrong theology, uh, no matter what it might be. Um, so I spoke uh, two weeks, two Sunday nights ago uh, on the, uh, the blessedness of reading the book. This book, the Bible, is anointed and given by God, and it's all, it's all inspired of God and good, and good for all of us, and um, it is uh, from Genesis to Revelation. Every bit of it, I, I believe it is. Some people don't understand Revelation. They think, well, it's kind of a waste of time. It's a lot of things. The guy was kind of... He had been feathered and tarred and left on the Isle of Patmos to die, and he wasn't in his right mind, and he was having weird visions, and it probably shouldn't even be in the Bible. I don't believe that for a second. I believe this is divinely inspired of God. The Word, as I mentioned, is interpreted by the Word. You read the Word to interpret the symbolisms. This book is communicated in symbols, but each symbol that it communicates has a literal truth. For instance, the devil isn't some big red dragon but he has the power. Uh, and, you know, he talked about knocking stars are not literal stars uh, out, out, out of the heavens. He talked about the fallen angels that fell and God threw them, threw them out of heaven. There's all kinds of symbolism that's literal, biblical truth that's not just in Revelation, but it's backed up in other places. The revelation of Jesus Christ does not introduce any new basic theology. It only supports the theology throughout Scripture. Are you with me? Okay. There's some details about end time that's, that's, that, that no, there's nowhere else and explains some things that we, gain, we glean. We see this picture of heaven clearer in chapters 4 and 5 than we can see ever anywhere else. But the, the, the thing of it is, it's a blessed book. And the Bible says those that read it will be blessed. And I believe a lot of people don't read the Bible, period. It's not going to do you any good to put it on your head when you go to sleep. It's not going to go into you. It's, you know, dust collecting it. You can carry it around. You can look good. You've got to read it. In, in reading, particularly the book of Revelation, the Bible says it's, you're, you're blessed to do so. So I urge you to read it, even if you don't understand. Read it and read it and read it. And uh, the Holy Spirit will, will help you. Uh, and then when there's teachings on it, and which we've had in classes as well as a little bit, it's a little different to teach it verse by verse than it is to preach it. Last week, Pastor Gary, I said, did I say something wrong? He said, yeah. 
And I said, what did I say? And he heard me say the second coming was the rapture. And I didn't mean to say that. I just don't think I was real clear. When Christ comes back, and it talked about when I was talking about that in chapter 1, that's coming back with the saints on the white horses. That's coming back after the seven years of great tribulation. So I've clarified it for you, my doc. So, Dr. Walter. So uh, there you go. Uh, and, then I, and then we talked about Jesus last week. And the first time he came as uh, Savior, he came this next time he's coming as judge. And the, 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 the difference when he comes again as the King of kings and Lord of lords with the great authority to judge, to judge and bring wrath upon those who've rejected him and mocked him, as opposed to the first time he comes with offering grace and offering his spirit. See, so see this book of the Bible anointed from God and given uh, that's a God-breathed book uh, 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 Genesis to Revelation and you see the contrast of these two great books uh, two of the greatest uh, books I think you could read in the first book in Genesis we see that creation the creation of heaven and earth and in the Revelation we see a new heaven and a new earth we see in the first book Genesis a paradise lost we see in the Revelation a paradise regained we see in Genesis man driven from the tree of life, and we see in Revelation man invited back to the tree of life. We see in Genesis Satan appears for the first time, and we see in Revelation Satan appears for the last time. <laughs> Amen? Yes. And we see in Genesis the beginning of pain and toil, the sorrows and of death, but we see in the Revelation no more sorrow, no more pain, no more tears, and no more death. We see the record of the first death in Genesis. We see there is no more death in Revelation. We see the first Adam and his, and, and his bride, Eve, in Genesis. And we see in the book of Revelation, Jesus Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ, the last Adam, and his bride, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, us who walk with him. Not by denominational attachments, but through personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Revelation is an exciting book, and God wants to bless us with it. And the golden key is in chapter 1 of Revelation, verse 19, 119, where it says, the Lord speaks to, the angel speaks to John, write the things which you've seen, then he says, and the things which are, and then he says, and the things which shall be hereafter. He's writing three things. He's seen which are and shall be hereafter. The things he has seen was up to that verse, 1 through 18. He wrote it. It was done. When he wrote, when he recorded 19, he was, the Lord spoke to him, and then he went and he wrote the thought, things that he saw. Then the things which are is what life was like then, right? And John knew the age of grace. And we're in the age of grace. We still are. The things that are are the letters to the churches, chapters 2 and chapters 3, the day of grace. Today, you still have an opportunity to repent and ask Jesus to forgive your sins and come to Christ with your life. And God's day of grace is here. His day of mercy is here. He's still a Savior. He's still reaching to us. He's still compelling us. But there'll come a day when the day of grace ends, just like it did when God destroyed the world and Noah closed the door of the ark. And that was it. The door was closed and no one else. It's a picture of a day of God's wrath and judgment was the flood. But for, for Noah, he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. But the door to the ark was closed and there was judgment. And there's going to be a day when the door of grace is closed on this earth and God's wrath is going to come. You say, yeah, but pastor, we read in the Bible about people during that time being martyred because they wouldn't take the mark of the beast. That's exactly right. But I want to address something. The Bible makes it clear that God descends in Thessalonians, that God sends a great delusion to those that knew the truth and didn't respond to it, and he causes them to believe a lie so that they won't respond to it afterwards. So if you're sitting here thinking, hey, guess what? If I miss the rapture, I just know all I got to do is not deny Jesus, and I can't, I'm not going to take the mark of the beast, and I'll be okay because I'll get to heaven. No, you won't. Because if you know the gospel and you haven't responded to the gospel, your opportunity is done as soon as 
the tribulation starts. You're done because God himself is going to see to it. And the reason is, is because you refused to believe the truth and accept the grace when it was right before you. You had the opportunity and you didn't do it and you're not getting another one. So I love David Crabtree, but he was wrong when he said what to do when you miss the, the, uh, the, the, the rapture and he began to tell you don't take the mark of the beast and don't do that that's all baloney it's written right in the scripture that, that, that God himself will cause people to believe a lie and bring great delusion so that they will be judged because they rejected during the day of grace God's grace and forgiveness and salvation all right, I may do a whole sermon on that, but I wanted to throw that out there. I felt compelled to do so. The, don't play rapture roulette because I'm telling you, you'll lose. You'll be ready all the time. So, so, the, so the things that are the church age, we're, we're in that right now. We're in chapters 2 and 3. We're in the day of grace. And the seven churches are, represent the seven as the complete or the whole. And so are those letters to the seven churches are good for all churches throughout time. It, they're, they're good for us. It's God's word to the churches still today and to us. And then he says, write the things which shall be hereafter. That's the future things, okay? And so the, the, the first thing we, we see is write the things which you've seen. That's number one, God's glory, God's glory. And I, I want to read what, what that was back again for those of you who weren't here last week. In Revelation 1, verse 10, on the Lord's day, and I'm reading the NIV, and I think we might have King James up there, okay? On the Lord's day, I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you see, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and among them lampstands, lampstands was someone like a son of man, addressed, uh, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze, glowing in the furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters, in other words, mighty. He, in his right hand, he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a, a sharp, double-edged sword. His faith face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. So this, this, uh, this, you know, let me read, uh, let me see, I'm going to go right through uh, verse 19, I'm sorry, um, dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and behold, I'm alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and hell. And write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later, the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So, so last week we talked about that, and we talked about Jesus. So that's God's glory. What is the glory of God? We've all fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3, 23. It's Jesus. It's his perfection. It's his whole, we've fallen short. You know, as I mentioned last week, Jesus, we saw him as Savior, but he's going to come as sovereign. We saw him as justifier, but he's going to come as judge. We saw him in humiliation when he died on the cross and took him on the form of a man, but we're going to see him in his glorification, glorified. And he had a, a a vision, John did, of this crucified, resurrected, ascended, and glorified Jesus Christ. And his full glory, as we mentioned last week, was unveiled. It's God's glory, the picture, the things that you've seen, John, write them. And uh, remember that one time, this same John laid his head on the breast of Jesus Christ, but not this time. He fell as dead when he saw him, as it pictured in Roman, in John, Revelation 1, rather. And so his coming is going to be full of power and of glory. And John's not going to be putting his head on the, 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 the chest of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came in humbling surroundings, plain and lowly and meek as a servant. Isaiah said of him, there's no form nor comeliness nor beauty that we should desire him. He came to be loved and received for who he was the first time. He didn't want to be loved for what he could do. He came to redeem us and to help us and to love us. But when he comes again, he's coming to judge. And the world needs to see this Jesus. So John is told to write the things 
which he has seen. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ is the name of the book. The second thing we see, not only God's glory, but God's grace, which is the church age, as I mentioned. And uh, chapters 2 and 3, the key word repeated over and over and over again is church. To the church, right. To the church, right. To the church, right. To the church, right. In chapter 4, you never see church again. From there, the end to the end of the book, you won't find church. Why? It's not there. That's why. Not, it's not mentioned. You know, uh, we're living in times known as the things which are. And uh, at, at, at um, uh, the Ephesus, the, the charge was that they left their first love when he wrote to the churches. They loved him, but not as much as they did. Let me tell you something. If there's ever a time that you love Jesus more than you love him now, or you were closer to Jesus than you are now, then what have you done? You've slid back. You were on fire to a certain level, and now there's a glow. Maybe that's called, in the writing, lukewarm to the churches. It, if, if it says, uh, chapter 2, in verse 4, it says, uh, Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. And uh, in Revelation chapter 3, verse 15 to 17, to the Laodicean church, he writes this, I know your works, how you're not, you're, how you're, uh, that thou, thou art neither cold nor hot. You're not cold or hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So then because you, you're lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. And because you say, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and know not that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, he's going to spew us out of his mouth. This is some strong words. See, these are some of the words that Jesus gave, and we have a prophetic word, and someone might go, wow, that's pretty strong. Yeah, Jesus was pretty strong, wasn't he? He, he, he came after the, just being lukewarm. There, he mentions a lot of, I know your works, you do this good. You do this good, you do this good, but this one thing you don't do good. So we need to, we need to look at those. Uh, G. Campbell Morgan, one of the greatest preachers ever walked the face of the earth, although I, didn't agree with all, I don't agree with all of his theology, so in case you happen to read and see something that I don't agree with, just know that I'm right and he's wrong. And um, um, I, I know that I'm going to be wrong about some stuff, so that's why I always have a little fun with that. But uh, he said, and I quote him, Lukewarmness is the worst kind of blasphemy. Lukewarmness is the worst kind of blasphemy. Lukewarmness says, God, I believe in you, but it just doesn't excite me. Lukewarmness is an insult to God and to his Savior, Jesus Christ. And it begins when you lose your first love. So you ask yourself, am I lukewarm? One thing that these seven uh, messages to the seven churches, these messages ring out loud and clear is that day by day we're to keep a wholehearted, on fire, uh, passionate love for Jesus Christ. And so I ask you, do you really love Jesus? When I was a teenager, a popular song, I believe it was a Gaither song, was like this, do you know my Jesus? Do you know my friend? Have you heard he loves me and that he will abide till the end? So the question is, do you really know Jesus? I'm, I'm concerned that in our America, the church has become a product and a business, and, and that many people come and like to believe the good feeling message of the Bible, but they have never really known Jesus, because when Jesus comes in, he sets a fire in your heart. He's a holy God with a holy spirit that produces a holy life, and many people name him by name, but their hearts are empty. And if your love is cool or growing cold, we need to wake up. I say that with kindness, but hear me, wake up because you're headed for all kinds of trouble. And these chapters end with the invitation in verse 20 uh, of, uh, of chapter 3 where he says, uh, I'm standing at the door, I knock, come, come. And while there's time, come. While grace is offered, he says, come. And so we have chapter 1, the things John has seen is God's glory. We have chapter Two and three, the church age is God's grace. And here's where I want to spend most of my time is God's government. And the third point is God's government. God's government. The things which shall be hereafter. Now I want you to go back 
to, uh, and, and I don't know if it'll be on the screen, but just go back one more time if you have your Bible and look at Revelation 1.19. If you can go back there, Brianna, at the very first met scripture that I had in the outline and put it up. Notice it says, write the things, and I'm going to read the King, uh, uh, let's see, what is this kind of version we have up here? This is not the King James. This is the NIV. Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. The King, later. The King James says, write the things which you've seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The things that shall be hereafter. Run to Revelation 4, 1 now, back where I was there, Brianna, and look at chapter 4, verse 1. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened where? In heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet calling me. The trumpet will sound, the shout of the Lord will happen, and we'll be caught up, the dead in Christ will rise first, and we'll be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. What, did he, what voice did he hear? He heard, as it were, of a trumpet talking to me, which said, what does it say? Come up here. I will show things which must be hereafter. I will show thee things which must be hereafter. The exact wording in verse 19 of chapter 1. The things which shall be hereafter. Again, verse 19. And the things which shall be hereafter. The last words. Verse 4, the last words. I will show thee the things which must be hereafter. It just changes it from shall to must. And uh, I, I just, I believe with everything within me, this is so clear. We have a trumpet. We have them calling to heaven. And the very next thing in, in chapter 4, you have the picture of heaven. There's the 12 elders there. There's uh, around the throne. There's the, the glassy sea. There's the saints. They look around in chapter 5 and, 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 and there's no one worthy to open the book. But they see a lamb standing in the midst, the standing representing that he's resurrected. He's not laying down dead anymore. He's alive. He's standing He's the living, resurrected Christ, and he was worthy to open the book. And all of heaven, of every tribe, tongue, and nation, it's a picture of heaven. It's a clear, there's no way that you can tell me that chapter 4 and 5 of Revelation isn't a picture of heaven. And it's a picture of heaven after the day of grace. Now, I want to tell you something. I came to this determination alone in my Bible and studying, trying to figure this out because used to be a lot of different thoughts on when does this catching away happen of the saints and the rising of the dead in Christ, the, what we call uh, the word the rapture. And I'm, I'm telling you, I am convinced as I can be that chapter 4, verse 1 is when that happens. So um, there's a lot of things that kind of run together when we hear about end times things. We hear about the rapture, the battle of Armageddon, the millennial reign, the great, you know, tribulation, et cetera, et cetera. So let's just look a quick overview, as I mentioned, of the timeline of the end time things and, and specifically how they'll come to pass. So here we go, the third division, the things which shall be hereafter, beginning with chapter 4, verse 1. And when the church age ends, a day of grace, the first event is the rapture of the church. And uh, it's when the church that hears the trumpet, the dead in Christ, and those that are still alive on earth will go up to meet the Lord in the air. The word rapture is what we use, but it's not found anywhere in the Bible, just like missions isn't found in the Bible, just like millennium is not found in the Bible. We talk about the millennial reign. It just means a thousand years. Just like Trinity is not in the Bible, but we hear it taught. It's just a short way to communicate. And uh, 1 Thessalonians, uh, the rapture comes from the Latin word, which means catching up that, the, 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 that the, those that are still alive and remain to be caught up to meet the Lord in there. If you want to call it the great catching up, go ahead and call it. You can call that you, all, all you want to, but when the roll is called up yonder, some will be catched up and others will be mustered out. So whatever, whichever way you want to look at it, that was funny, I'm telling you right now, that you might as well go ahead and laugh. If you, you got to pay attention because this stuff will go right over your head. Be caught up. That's fine if you don't want to use rapture, but that's what, that's what is commonly called in the church world. And then the next thing that happens, uh, that when the trumpet sounds and the, the, the angel shouts and, 
and, and the dead in Christ rise, and those that are still alive and remain are caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And then it says, and it mentions that over there, here's another thing, therefore comfort one another with these words. Meaning earth, life's earth might be a little bad then, and you might, you know, it might get bad and you go, hey, there's coming a day when this will all end. That's the comfort, right? Someday, hey, you, you're dead, you got some dead people, what, they're in the comfort. It's comfort, because they're going to come up if they've died in Christ, right? And, and if there's trouble on the earth, comfort, because this is not all there is, but we live like it is. There's a comfort. So you see that, which I think is a sign that, that we're going to go through a lot of hard times before the end comes, but, but be comforted, because there is an end, and there is a catching away. And so then the next thing, right when that happens, I believe that the great tribulation, ha- the great tribulation happens, which seven years the Bible describes in two, three and a half year periods of tribulation. The first three and a half, not as great as the last three and a half. And so the Bible even says, as the earth has never ever seen, so great will be the trouble on earth and the tribulation like you've never seen. All you got to do is read history. All you got to do is go back to World War II. All you got to go back, go, go back to Hitler's soldiers and how, what they did to women and babies in front of their mothers and small children and see what they've done. And you'll know that that's, that's not the worst that can happen, that there's going to be even worse when God's wrath is poured out. And that's what it calls it. In Revelation chapter 9, in, in verse 6, it says this. See, I got it on the screen. During those days, people will seek death, but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will elude them because of how bad it will be. So, um, what we call death today will be welcomed, a relief from the suffering of the day. And God's going to pour out his wrath upon the world during this seven years. And the world will be filled with demon spirits tormenting men and people will go to the rocks and mountains and they'll cry out for them to fall on them. And that's specific, specifically speaking to, to some, some that I believe in the Jewish land of Israel. The Antichrist will, will rule with power worldwide. We'll be uh, talking about the, the Antichrist later when I, when I get to that someday, maybe a couple of years. Uh, but, but if the Lord tarries, but, in, but I'm just telling you, there's a good chance the Antichrist could be alive now. I mean, we're never any closer than we are today. And, you know, and I'd rather state and you think, yeah, he could be alive and, and the devil's just waiting to put him into place. Because the spirit of Antichrist has been here and has risen up in many people that have tried to be world dictators. Uh, there's no doubt that, in my mind that Hitler had the spirit of Antichrist because it's exactly he wanted to rule. He wanted people to bow before him. He wanted to, to be have the authority over all people and choose life and death for whoever. And uh, so it, it could be right today. There's the rapture. There's the great tribulation, seven, uh, seven years of great tribulation that will happen on the earth and the saints will be gone. And in heaven during that seven years, we're at the Lamb's Supper. We're celebrating and God is all handing out the w- rewards for works. And some of us, because our motives aren't too pure, might get like wood, hay, and stubble, but at least we made it. Right? You might get gold and silver, you know, but, but you're not being judged for your sins because of the blood of Christ. But during that seven years, is going to be the Christians in heaven. So we'll be up there with Jesus while it's a bad time on earth called the wrath of God, the time of great tribulation. Um, and the problem with the middle trib, like after three and a half years, then the rapture takes place. Here's my problem with that, is that if that happens, then um, uh, and, and the post-trib position, both of them, is we're able to count the days when Jesus would come following the events foretold. So you can just, you can just see this, this has already happened, and you can count it down, and uh, there's three and a half more years, or there's three and a half years because this just happened, and, but the Bible says that such a, a, a day, such an hour that the Son of Man will come when you think not, when, when you know, uh, and that you, you don't know, such an hour, you think not the Son of Man comes, it says. So I don't, I don't believe, I don't believe mid-trib and post-trib, I believe it's, at the, the rapture will happen before the Great Tribulation. And it'll end with the Battle of Armageddon. So at the end of the seven year period, Jesus is going to, what they call the second coming. He's going to come back in the clouds and with the sword, with the spoken word, with the sword out of his mouth, he's going to destroy the enemies that come against God's people. And the saints that have been raptured are going to come with him. And when Satan is thrown away and put in a pit for 
uh, a thousand years to be judged later and all of his little minions and everything at that point, then uh, uh, we will, that thousand years, it's called the millennial reign. A millennium is a thousand and we'll be reigning with Christ on earth. I don't know what that's going to look like. Um, it's that, that's really, I don't know. All I know is, is you won't be bullied by people because you're a Christian. <laughs> Jesus, the King of Kings, is going to be here, right? You're not going to get bullied. Uh, and so I, I, I think that we, we can look forward to that stuff. And so the time of the rapture is close. Uh, I believe that old Gabriel is licking his lips, getting ready to blow that trumpet. And uh, I think we need to be sure we have our pa suitcase packed. Uh, the Antichrist will make a treaty with Israel for seven years, right, but, you know, that leads into this uh, because it talks about, they say, peace and safety. I think Israel will think they're safe, but in the middle of it, the seven years, the old Antichrist himself, he goes in, he says, bow down he, as, as God. The Jews will wake up and say, no way, you're not. There'll be a great revival of many Jewish people because of God's mercy that uh, that they will come to know Christ and there will be people saved during the rapture time, but not those who have had a clear presentation of the gospel like you and I that are in Christian churches that won't include us. And, uh, and the Antichrist will move into the temple that will be rebuilt and show himself as God. The Jews will wake up. Like I said, he realized he's not Christ and they will not worship him. And when they refuse to worship the Antichrist, he will turn on Israel uh, with hatred and fury of Satan which he's always had against Israel. That's why uh, the nations come against Israel and uh, the world hates Jews because it's the spirit of Satan. The Antichrist is in our world today and the Antichrist will seek to destroy them and call the nations together to the Valley of Armageddon. And by the way, uh, just, just, think, just thinking about that, that um, um, is what a miracle it is that the Jews came from all over the world and in 1948 the nation was reborn and to be able to fulfill what's written in Scripture. And all nations of the world will encircle Israel to destroy them and the Antichrist will serve Satan and worship Satan in exchange for rule over the world and the devil will turn the kingdoms of this world over to the Antichrist and, uh, and uh, remember Satan tried to get Jesus to bow down and worship him and said I'll give you the kings of this world whatever just wor bow down and Jesus answered the, the, that you shall worship the Lord thy God and him only shall you serve and Satan makes a deal with the Antichrist and the Antichrist uh, will lead all the people the nations of the world against Israel to try to exterminate God's people the battle will be inter interrupted by Jesus and his saints and I mentioned that as the second coming of Christ and I want to read Revelation 16 16 that says then they gathered the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. In Revelation 19, 19 and 20, then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on his, the horse and his army. But the beast was captured with its false prophet who had performed the signs in its behalf by the power of demons and the devil. Don't be, don't, don't just follow miracles because the devil's going to have, Antichrist's going to have miracle power in that day. Uh, who, who had performed the signs of, uh, 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 on its behalf. With these signs, he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshiped its image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest were killed with the sword coming out of the mouth of the rider of the horse, and all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. I've seen that, that valley of Armageddon, the Megiddo Valley. It's amazing. And I'm telling you that... Uh, that it's, that is a big area, and I'm telling you that there's going to be so much death that's going to happen there when Jesus comes back with the church uh, and, just, and, and does that. The Antichrist has destroyed Israel, God's chosen, delivered, and Israel will believe on Jesus, and he'll rule on the earth for a thousand years. And, uh, and so uh, that's, that's what happens there. And then also, I don't know what else I have to say because I kind of jumped ahead and said what's in my notes. Revelation 20, verse 6, talks about this ruling. It says, blessed or holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign. Second death is the death is eternal separation uh, from God. And, and as believers, that will not happen to us. Jesus is not finished with this earth. 
God made a promise that Jesus was going to rule from the throne of David, and God has a purpose in this. We pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And the Bible says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Isaiah the prophet says, the earth shall be filled with the the knowledge of the glory of the Lord and as the waters that cover the sea. This time of millennial reign will be full of the glory of God. And then the, the, the final judgment we read in Revelation 20, verse 11 to 15. Then I saw a great white throne. This is the great white throne judgment. These are for both the living and the dead that will be raised up from the dead to be judged for their sins. The great white throne and him who was seated on it, the earth and the heavens fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, uh, great and small, standing before the throne and the books were open. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they, I can't see that, had done. The sea gave up the dead that were in it and death and Hades uh, gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death in Hades was not found written in the book. I mean, rather, anyone who was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. That's not a good picture. So death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death, okay? And anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. It's confusing back there because they have the verse that's up here and the next verse that's not up there yet. So old people get confused when they read scripture from there. I'm not saying I'm old, but you might be able to detect that. So anyway, that's the final judgment of the unsaved dead. The final judgment of the wicked dead. Those unsaved will not happen until after the thousand year reign. It's after the millennial. Why? Well, because the final record of all that was done is not in until the very end of time. You're not ready to be judged until the record is in. Corrupted hearts and minds and morals of so many people, like Hugh Hefner, his life continues to pour death and damnation on many people because of the course set by his direction toward a destination that not only impacted him, but a world. He couldn't face judgment now because his full record is not in. He has set things in motion, corrupted people who corrupt other people. And God waits until it's all finished, until the very end for the final judgment. The judgment's not to determine whether we're saved or lost or where you're going. That happens when you die. The judgment's not for the saved. It's the unsaved in hell, the abode of the dead. That abode of the dead, Hades, is like a jail waiting for final sentencing. And uh, Hades has a soul. And verses 14, 15, they're cast into the lake of fire that we just read. And it'll be worse in hell, in the lake of fire, for some than others. Did you know that? Just like it'll be better for some of you in heaven than others. Jesus, for example, says, uh, and here's an example. You say, well, how do you know that, Pastor? Well, it says in, in Matthew 10, 15, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah than for those, these certain wicked cities who were outwardly religious. Uh, there's a story that says, uh, if Tyre and Sidon would have had the opportunity to know what you know, uh, and then, and, 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 you know, they would have repented. And it's going to be worse for you. So if you don't make heaven... After all the preaching and the truth is made known to you, it's not going to be very good for you. Will you bow your head with me? Some of you need to ask Jesus to forgive your sins and start a journey of faith that follows him with honesty. It's not just religious and not just every once in a while show up at church that you're a walking in your faith with him. Others of you need to need to lay aside and heed the word given this morning to pursue God, seek Him first, to get your guardrails up, to be serious about walking holy, to be the church, to look like the church, to let the pur purity and the holiness of Christ be yours because there is a judge that's coming. He's come to save us so that we won't be judged. 
With every head bowed, if you'd close your eyes, and the reason for that is to respect your neighbor so that I can say everyone's not watching. If you're here and you need to make some things right with God, or if you need for the first time to invite Jesus to forgive your sins and be your Savior and take away your sin, would you lift your hand quickly right now and say, pray for me. I want to be ready. Yes, I see your hand. I see your hand. Anyone else? Something, someone that you say, I'm a believer, but I need to be, I need to get back on fire for God, the mediocrity, the lukewarmness. I need to have my life stirred once again with the fire of God uh, and uh, burn for God. And you say, I, I, I believe I'm saved, but I'm sure not where I need to be. And I want to be closer to God. I want to heed the warning of this book. And I want to raise my hand and say, Pastor, that's me. I want to, I want to be full of fire. So many of you all over are raising your hands, and I, I, I think that's so good. It's so good. It's so good. How long has it been since you knelt and prayed? It's just in time before God. How long has it been since you soaked in the Word? How long has it been since you turned off the TV for a week and not watched anything and fasted that? Or fasted food that you might pray? How long has it been? How long has it been since you witnessed to someone about Jesus that they need him in their life? That you've testified, tried to bring someone to Jesus because he's the only one that has life. How long has it been? Ask yourself and then measure. God, is the fire of God still in me like it once was? Then you, then you deal with that.